and yellow just dumping it in now. Should I go get more rocks? Yes, please. And Julie goes, well, it's got to be light. <laughs> I got to be able to move it because it, I know it's going to be cool and I want to keep it. Right. And, <laughs> and, and she's kind of saddled me with all these different things that, and I say saddled, not in a bad way, in a good way. Right, because I love doing this type stuff. She, she very cleverly said, "Here's a book, Darwin. My gift to you." <laughs> Oops. I didn't even know what a rocket mass heater was two months ago. Yeah. Just at a loss of finding a lightweight solution to make something portable. Um, I was at a complete loss, and then I came across something called Aircrete, and I looked into it, and it's made completely of Portland cement. And then in my research having to do with refractory mixes, um, it became clear to me that Portland cement just turns to powder and does not hold up in a refractory type setting. And so I researched other lightweight refractory type mixes that would put up with a lot of heat. And I came up with some that I thought would work good. And, and hours and hours and ton of tests on these mixes to get them right. Cue the picture. Uh, it's there and you know it's I love the stuff you put a coating on it it's basically would be impervious to water the absorption rate of it uh, isn't that high as it sits right now but you throw this in water and it'll float most concretes don't float and I, I just had some questions um, mm -hmm. Uh, about the heat riser and how I came up with it and it's all Julie just so you know that's what? yeah that's how I came up with it I read a book one time a story about Henry Ford and how his engineers came to him month after month for 18 months and told him it couldn't be done you could not cast a single block V8 motor it just can't be done and he told him go ahead and do it go ahead and do it and so I basically had decided on using a different refractory instead of a lightweight one that weighs, these heat risers weigh maybe a pound and a half or two each. Uh, I basically decided on doing that. And it was a much heavier mix. And uh, then Julie had to go off and make a video that said, Aircrete meets rocket mass heater. And so I felt kind of obligated to at least try and come up with something. And after I kind of got that push, you know, like Henry Ford pushed his engineers. After I got that push, it was just on my mind. And I think the law of attraction took effect and uh, what have you. But uh, I had this crazy idea that because I had seen water glass used in combination with perlite as the water glass being the uh, adhesive to make a refractory mix. And... I thought, what if I could make a glass foam with my foam mate? What if I could turn this glass, this soluble glass, that when, when you get it warm, turns, it literally turns to permanent glass as soon as you heat it up and get all the air out of it. I want you to see this. Are you getting your torch and lighting it up? I am going to light this up. You bet I am. But this stuff is like a syrup. And, uh, and you actually have to dilute it to get it to um, absorb into concrete at all for any, but you, just a thin layer. As soon as you heat it and get all the water out of it, it, turns, it, it expands, binds, and turns to glass, and it's hard. And what does it look a lot like? Perlite. Isn't that amazing? It does. It looks just like perlite. Yeah. Okay, hold on. But, That's super cool. I did not understand what you were saying when you told it to me before, but it does. It bubbled up. Yeah, and it turns hard and acts as a binder and an adhesive when it's around things. So I thought, why don't I do this crazy thing and try and make foam out of soluble glass? water soluble glass and in train it into portland cement which is portland cement in the refractory community is a no-no because it tends to turn p things to powder and so i went ahead and did that i made a foam glass 
mixed it in with the perlite. I was concerned about doing the perlite. There are some changes I'm going to make to it uh, to try and perfect it. But as it sits, it works great. I mean, you saw the video of that stove raging last night, and it was raging right through this uh, so that's, deal. So is that now? The this one it? is I coated. Okay. Okay, and um, this one has not been coated. So it's rough. And okay, so it's rough, crumbly. and it's a it that came out when I took the. Uh, center form out. I got a little impatient after a day and a half. I tried to take them apart. Should have waited four days. Mm -hmm. Okay, but even so, I took it apart. I went ahead and um, slow baked it just to try and speed up the curing process because I'm impatient. And But I would recommend you keep them moist and covered with a moist towel and let them sit for four or five, seven days. Uh, before you try taking them apart. But as it sits, I needed to take this one because it needed a bigger end and have it reduced down to the four inch hole in the center. I needed to file it off and make it bigger. And I noticed it was really rough and kind of brittle. And so I came up with this idea kind of by experimenting. I have these bricks that I've made and I would cut off slices of it. Here, let's do it this way. I would cut off slices of it. <laughs> this is aircrete, by the way, guys. Just straight aircrete. Okay. So I would take a slice of this aircrete, and I wanted to know the absorption rate, so I threw it in water, and I broke it open. And I'm going to show you guys that here in a sec. But that's kind of my thought process, how I came up with the idea to seal these, right? So I'm going to seal this one for you. Yeah, I'm going to seal this one for you while you're watching. So I took a thing of aircrete, threw it in water to see kind of what the absorption rate was, threw it in the water, snapped it, and looked. And I also took it and threw it in a solution of water glass this stuff soluble glass oh there we go you see it floats mm -hmm. okay so I'm gonna turn it over a little I just wanted to leave it in there and kind of see what the absorption rate is and this is what I'm talking about I don't know if I'm gonna break this. there we go I wanted to kind of see how fast it absorbed in there as straight water. And then I wanted to see the absorption rate of water glass. This stuff is so syrupy, it didn't absorb in very well at all. So I had to dilute it a little bit. I diluted it about 50-50 and I made a mix like this. I don't know, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And my idea was, is that I could take and seal my that are a little bit maybe brittle, I could take water glass solution and soak it into it till it's good and soaked and seal it. And this is going to be crazy what you guys see next because it, I mean you see all these little divots and little pits in the uh, refractory mix because of the perlite uh, that I used kind of as, a, a, as an aggregate. It's still kind of soaking it up. There it, it quit soaking. So I just keep putting it on until it kind of quits soaking it up real fast. And then I needed something to remove the moisture in the water out of this so it was a concentrate again. So it would perform right when it got put under heat and I put it on the rocket mass stove. So to remove the uh, water from it, which I just put a little Portland cement on there to act as an uh, absorber, which that's what Portland cement does is it uh, dissipates water. That's how concrete works. 
you make it with water and as long as it's moving it's good to go but watch this look how smooth that's getting it's filling all the pitted areas in where the glass is you can see the moisture soaking and the water glass soaking up into it and I just kept doing that until the uh, Portland cement basically stayed dry and so when you see this one and you see the little outside layers that were flaking off I'm not worried about that at all because there's another layer under and there's this water glass that soaked into it like a quarter of an inch that has just kind of created a glass like uh, coating around the whole refractory so and I mean look how smooth it makes it how smooth it makes the uh, all the divots that were in there kinda crazy and then I just let it sit and dry uh, because this let the Portland cement remove the water from the water glass and then after I got the rocket stove going and put this riser on it it got hot and it it just sealed them I mean look at the inside of that can you see that mm -hmm. is that crazy and this has been subject to about 1800 degrees for hours last night this uh, mix I mean I ran this thing on two separate occasions for at least four hours at a time with white blue flames shooting through it um, the insulative properties of it is insane where in the right above right above the vortex chamber where it was like 16 1800 degrees uh, the most I could get on the outside of this can was 160 degrees freaking crazy it I mean this as an insulated riser it works awesome that's all I can say. I, he was having so much fun playing with that rocket mask. I was stressed night. out at wondering whether this mix was just going to crumble and fall apart. Was I not, babe? I yeah, just, I was I like, I, knew it I was, was like, I should have put some clay in it. I, I should have did this. I should have did that. I, yep, you were. yeah, oh I'm like, Don't what if this doesn't babe, work? It's going to put me a week behind and Julie will hate me. Oh, no. <laughs> I've just been like, well, um, we're leaving. I hope I can get a whole bunch of <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, um, I still got to seal these two. They haven't been sealed. And the way I did it after um, these tops weren't perfect, so I took my file and I filed them down till they were level with the edge of the can before I sealed them. Just like that. And you can see this mix, it files, it's, it's a little more, because I have perlite entrained in it at a high rate, it's a little more brittle than I like. I'm wondering at this point, because I've taken, I'm wondering at this point is if you just took normal aircrete and soaked it in a bath of 50% uh, water glass, and then just ran it on the stove and let it get hot if it would make a good enough refractory you know so I I don't know but all I know is the insulative properties that the perlite adds I thought was important and so I kept it now things I would change because when I did go when I did go to um, file this out it was it did feel a little bit brittle. Now that being said, I took it out of the form too soon and I speed cured it by heating it, which in Portland cement is a no-no, okay? If I would have let it cure out for at least seven days, I think it would have performed way better even on that. But I did what I did and so I had to fix it and so I sealed it with the method that I just showed you. Things I would change, okay? You have to dilute this down to one-third water glass to get it to make a decent foam. 
I think that's an issue. I don't think it was a high enough concentration of water glass in the mix. Um, the great thing is, is Julie's stove comes all apart and if the riser starts to go or something this winter, I can easily replace it instantly, you know. So it's not that big of a deal. But um, things I would change and an idea that I have for another test mix that I'm going to do before I put out the final PDF on what would be the best, okay, is I'm going to take uh, water glass in a concentrated form, mix up perlite with it until it's like wet sand, take fire clay, bentonite, and if you've ever seen this stuff, it's absolutely crazy. It will grow to six times its own size. It will hold six times its own weight in water, okay? So it is, uh, it's a crazy clay, um, but it's a, it makes a great fire clay once it's cured out. And so I'll take this, wet it with water glass, mix this in just enough, you know, homogeneously until it's evenly just kind of a, has a light coating on every grain. Then make the aircrete with regular foam and then drop these pellets that have been soaked in water glass and absorbed water glass. Uh, then entrain them in by themselves. You saw how this water glass expanded when I heated it, right? I think once we put a riser into effect and put heat to it, the the binders in this are going to expand out beyond themselves to each other and I think that would make a better mix. Just in my experience with uh, what I've done here in my different tests, I'm going to try that one just to try and perfect something, you know, because I can't let something go unperfected. So if, so if the original heat riser, the one you've already made, did start to give, what would be the signs? What would be the safety signs to watch for? Or is there really that much concern about safety? Is it just you would know? You would look at it and you'd be like, something's cracking, something's overheating. We need to fix something. Um, there's really no safety concern because there's, uh, it would just quit performing efficiently. Right? What the riser does, it creates an insulation so that the differential between the air outside of it and the air inside of it is a huge differential. That makes the air rise more quickly. And the more quickly the air rises, the more of a negative pressure it creates in the uh, gasification and burn chamber, and uh, the more of a negative pressure it creates so that you can draw additional oxygen in to the vortex area. Um, it would just quit. It, there's no safety concern. It's totally encased and shrouded by the downdraft deal. It, um, it, it, it would just stop working efficiently, and you could tell. So that's fantastic. Um, will this crumble and come down with that? Me soaking it with uh, water glass and completely uh, curing it out with heat? No. This is not going to. This is not going to come apart. It, uh, it may hollow out in the center where I didn't get the water glass soaked into it, but I don't even think that's going to happen because it's entrained with water glass. And when I say, will it fail, I don't think it's going to fail fail. I just don't think it's as good as it could be. I would like <laughs> the concentration of water glass entrained into the concrete to be higher. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's all. I just, if you take, and so look at this. I'll do the other side of this. Um, and this is an example. This is a part of this mix that I put into a bread pan. Uh, but I'll do the other side real quick. And, and this is the diluted stuff. About 50-50 diluted. You see it's not thick and syrupy. Mm You see the difference? Yeah, there's a huge difference. A it's huge difference. Because it's not, it's too diluted. Mm. And so I want, I just want a more concentrated water glass entrained in this. 
does it act as a binder between the microscopic um, dust or of, of Portland concrete? I mean, because this stuff is... Yeah. Okay, try that again. Yeah, the microscopic dust in Portland concrete, because that stuff is microscopic particles. This, this is, what, about three quarters of an inch thick. And I literally, I could do this all day and not burn my hand. Look, it's getting red hot. I mean red hot. You see it? Are you getting the redness? I'm not sure how much closer I can bring my camera. Oh. Because I, I, can, I can feel the heat here. It's hot. <laughs> yeah, it's hot. Yeah. But I mean... Oh, there I got the red. Yeah, there that'll right never... And see, look. It has some water glass entrained in it. Uh -huh. You can you can see you see it. Yeah. It's it's hard to see, but there's that, that um, discoloration uh -huh. and stuff. That's this has never been heat treated. This is just a straight mix that I let cure out, and so it. Dang, it's hard. And you it, used to help on bridges and roads and other things. Yeah, like we with... we did. I've done thousands of tests on concrete on rock cores where we cored down and took rocks and you have to cut them you know if it's a two inch round you have to cut it exactly four inches long and make sure they're perfectly level and then we put them in this machine that crushes them until they explode and it tells them what the failure rate is and we do that same thing with concrete um, we would break them at seven days 14 days 21 days and 28 days and they had to perform up to specification by 28 days. And typically by the seventh day, you could tell if it was going to go all the distance or if you needed to make a al uh, chemical alteration to your mix. And different mixes need different properties. Some concrete needs to be more flexible than others. Some concrete needs to take more compressive strength and be more rigid than others. And depending on if you're building a bridge or a bridge abutment or a foundation for a... Um, a building or what have you and so um, concrete is awesome it's kind of fun I have a kind of a keen sense of how it works I've never done refractory mixes so I don't have a keen sense about them but how they would react together I kind of have a feeling for it a little bit not everything I did worked a lot of it failed cue the picture there's a bunch of right <laughs> okay and uh, I don't think your stove is going to fall apart, right? And if it did... It's okay, we'd all die. No. Oh, God. The stove would just quit working. <laughs> right? And see, that's the thing is so. when you do some of these DIY projects where you really don't know your stuff, it would be nice to have somebody you could say, your stove isn't going to explode and it's not going to melt. It'll just stop working. And that way the mama in me, he's like, I like to sleep soundly at night. I don't want to have to have one ear open. Because on most wood stoves, you have to have an ear open just a little bit at night with the wood stove. And so having somebody who really knows what he's talking about, knows the math and can say, it'll just stop working. It won't catch fire. It won't melt. It'll just stop working. Makes me feel a lot better. Awesome. I'm glad you feel better. <laughs> well, it's, it's a huge amount. Of, I mean, you think about it. No, it's a huge it amount of trust. It's, I got two little kids in that cabin, and I'm the stupid one who's doing all these this experimentation with the tiny living. I'm really, right. I'm really doing some things that most people don't do, and so this is one of the biggest experiments we've done so far. And I think it's the only one I've done where I was a little bit worried to start with. She was. I was. I was really worried. Oh yeah, she was. She would call me and. Are you sure it's not going to melt? Yeah. Are you sure it's not going to melt? Is and this pulling all the oxygen out of our house? Right? <laughs> Just a little, you know, a lot of people think I'm an irresponsible parent because no. of some of the adventures my family has. But really, when I feel like it comes down to the safety of my kids, I would rather know that, that it was something that was tried and true. Darwin took a lot more time on this than he probably had to as far as making it really thorough. And so... Um, one other thing is that John really wants to live in a monolithic dome, so the fact that Darwin put together this foam mate, and you said you can even make one bigger. Oh, yeah, I'm going to. Go, uh, go grab the well mate tank. And this is another thing I sourced for free, and I know where I could get a hundred of them, so I'm going to do a sourcing video about these as well. But instead of using that little um, ABS oh. and PVC tank as the tank, I'm just going to plumb it into this, and so I can do bigger projects. Can you get these in, say, 
40, 60 gallons? Absolutely. Yeah, I can go get as many as I want. But it's a fiberglass pressure tank. And uh, when the bladders go bad, people just throw them away and they just go sit in a landfill. And uh, I know where there's hundreds of them. And uh, I'm going to be able to do huge projects. I'm going to be able to do projects where I have 50 gallons of just foam uh, concentrate mm -hmm. in a tank and be able to run an air compressor through it and make hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gallons of concrete every day to do these larger projects that my wife is insistent that I do. And guess what? I am the honeydew carpenter and that's how everything got done was my wife wanted me to do it. Well, and, and if you live for the yeah. project, then it's nice to have somebody who appreciates your, your right. expertise. So I'm excited. The thing I'm think I'm most excited about is to see his little projects along the way. Like I I have absolutely no idea what your next project with Aircrete is going to be with. But if you guys haven't looked into Aircrete, there's some videos out there about Aircrete where people use them to build homes. You can use them to build fences. You can you can do pretty much anything with it where you want it to have high insulative properties and to be light. Right. And and hopefully it saves you money because again, like Darwin said, most of it is air. This brick super light. This brick, it's like a feather. <laughs> so whenever, whenever he has time after he's finished with my rocket mass heater, you gotta excited, have your priorities straight, I'm right? I'm excited to see what the next project is going to be once he's done with my project. So, um, so Honeydew Carpenter shop on Etsy uh, and make sure to watch that shop because they will be bringing more stuff out and I as they bring more stuff out, I'm going to be trying out their projects to see if somebody like me, who loves duct tape, can figure out how to weld and figure out how to use an aircrete machine. So make sure to go check that out, and we'll talk to you later. Okay, you you see the aluminum just already it melted out of there. I don't know if you've seen that, but but yeah, that aluminum form that I used to form this uh, portal just melted right out. the longest time, the only way people made rocket mass heaters was Cobb style, and um, it has a certain aesthetic, which can be very beautiful, but some people want a wood aesthetic. So this is basically a wood box, and it has a granite top, and um, it isn't finished, so we need to get the rest of the granite top to go on here, and, but even though it's not finished, uh, we've been using it for the last couple of years. Um, and it has worked better than we ever imagined it would. And, and our imagination goes pretty far. Um, originally, when we first built this, the rocket part of it was so rockety that it was sucking the flames off of the wood. And the system was burning far too hot. We were actually worried about it. So we did a bunch of things to slow the system down and cool the system down. Uh, the wood feed was reduced 35%. Um, we added a bunch of bends and turns in the exhaust system going through the bench um, and, uh, and, and slowed down, but it still runs very hot, has a very strong burn. This house is, um, uh, we call it the Fisher Price house. It's a plastic house. It is what you uh, call a, a double wide. So this house is effectively a Ziploc bag. It's sealed. And so we were really worried about it when we built it, that if all the doors and windows are closed and somebody turns on a bathroom fan, is that going to make this whole system run backwards and then suck smoke into the house? Um, or what if both bathroom fans are running and the kitchen fan and the dryer? Because the dryer blows air outside too. So, I'm happy to report that when we uh, run both bathroom fans, the kitchen fan and the dryer simultaneously, this thing still roars in the correct direction. And I don't know what those fans are doing, but I imagine this thing is pulling air backwards from those fans. Because <laughs> the draw is so powerful. We believe that this system um, is burning well beyond 3000 degrees, possibly. Uh, well, the first time we burned it, the first time we burned it, it was burning too hot. Ernie was thinking it may be touching 4,000 degrees. So we think that this is the hottest rocket mass heater known. 
Um, it's got a ceramic fiber core, uh, and it's an eight inch system, and we think that if we could do it all over again, we would probably um, switch this eight inch duct out with six inch duct, maybe even five inch duct, and make it a much leaner, smaller system, and it would still run uh, very, very warm. Now, this system does a great job of, of demonstrating uh, what a rocket mass heater can do. Um, on days when it gets cold enough outside that it is definitely below freezing every night. Um, I think with a conventional wood stove you would be running a fire multiple times a day. We'll run a fire in here for maybe an hour, hour and a half, and it'll get the temperature in here up to 75. And then um, the next morning we get up and the temperature in the house might be 70, 72. So notice we didn't get up in the middle of the night <laughs> to stoke the fire. And then the next day, it might be getting down to 68, maybe 65, something like that. And that's where it's below freezing every night. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very cold time of the year. This is January. And we'll have a fire every other day. So, because So to jump in here, because some people are going to say, well, that's just a well-insulated house. So if you have like a, this exact same house and you run a conventional stove, mm -hmm. then you'll be cold in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, you'll get up in the morning and it'll, it'll be like, like, somebody better start a fire because I'm not getting out of my covers. <laughs> so on the next morning, you'll come out here and you'll put your hand on the mass and it is very warm, maybe too warm to touch still. And so it's just exuding all of this heat and it just exudes it around the clock. And, um, you know, one could debate about whether or not that it's enough heat or not, but, but this is a pebble style mass and it doesn't even hold the heat as well as a cob mass does. So, um, and it, it still performs very well. Um, we have people that have uh, had a house that had a conventional wood stove and then they would burn six cords of wood every year for many, many years. And then they switched to using a rocket mass heater and they went down to less than a cord per year. So same house, same climate, same insulation, same material for burning, same everything. The only thing that changed was the heat source. This one's and all done. It has an amazing Cobb style rocket mass heater in it that has been tested for three winters and has been awesome. The big experiment, the first big experiment that we had here was to uh, put a rocket mass heater into a teepee. And a lot of people get confused over the three different kinds of heat. So there's uh, convective heat, which is heating the air and then the air heats you. That's the least efficient form of heat, but that's the most common way that people heat their homes. Then there's radiant heat. So for example, the sun is a source of radiant heat. It's over there, it's really hot, I can feel the warmth on my face. And then the most efficient form of heat is conductive heat. And that's what we're going to have a lot of in here, where there's going to be a warm bench, and when you sit on it or when you touch it, you feel the warmth, and that heats you. It's not even very warm, but it heats you a lot. So, what we have here is a lot of conductive heat, a bit of radiant heat, and really very little convective heat. Uh, there was a couple that was living in here. They uh, One night it got to be 26 below and they didn't know how cold it was outside. So they got up and they uh, took off their night clothes and got under their day clothes and they said that it felt like the temperature inside was a little over 50. And it wasn't until they got outside until they realized that it was bitter cold outside. And the fire went out at 9 o'clock and when they got out of bed in the morning it was still very warm inside, even though there had been no fire for like eight hours. But the thing is, is that we're not having trouble with teaching people how to build a rocket mass heater. Where we're really struggling is that people are having a hard time believing that a rocket mass heater works as advertised. So when we say you heat a home with one tenth of the wood, um, there's all these hurdles. It's like, no, people, people are sure, no, it doesn't do that, and no, it doesn't do that. So we need to come up with ways to prove that this works, to prove it. And so this is one of those things. We built a rocket mass heater 
in a teepee. Everybody knows a teepee is a non-insulated space. There is no insulation. And everybody knows that air moves through a teepee. And so there's nothing in a teepee that's going to line up with an insulated home. And yet these people stayed warm eight hours after the fire had gone out and it was 26 degrees below zero outside. And, and the funny bizarre thing is, is that most people have it in their head that if you go to the store and you buy a wood stove and it says 75% efficient, they're sure that that's the truth. What they don't realize is that, first of all, it's actually 59% efficient, but they're allowed that 16% for heat that goes up the chimney. So it's actually a 59% efficient wood stove. And then the other thing is, is that they're not aware of how it's tested in the lab and that they'll monkey with little tiny factors of like using kiln dried wood, which nobody is using to heat their home. And they're like in increasing the air pressure in the room where it's being tested in order to be able to push more air through the system. But a typical home is kind of like a Ziploc bag. And as you, as you burn a fire in it, then the air is pulled out of the room and then it's like the pressure inside is lower. So it's harder for the air to get into the stove system. So these are all factors that are not in the laboratory where they got this number, 75% efficient. And when people put a big log on the fire at night and go to bed, they're actually running their stove at 3% efficiency. So they look at this pumped up number as part of the advertising for a conventional wood stove and they say there's no way you could heat a home with one tenth the wood. That means that they're buying into the marketing until somebody proves the marketing wrong. I'm trying to prove the marketing wrong. <laughs> Were they shorter than us? Isn't this so this would really count as a tiny house. <laughs> How many square feet is this, do you think? Oh. 100? That well, let's see. The original TP was 18 feet in diameter. of money on a buckwheat hole mattress in organic cotton to have something and it was crazy how expensive it was sure. um, to have something